gather together. It is wonderful to be able to be inside. Our 8 o'clock service had about 34 people here. Um, they're so glad to be together. Normally, this service will be meeting outside, but because of the weather, of course, we've come in, at least for the time being. That is the plan. But today is the second Sunday of Easter. And what that means for us is that today we hear the story about Thomas, that, that apostle that we so often call and refer to as Doubting Thomas. But doesn't Thomas reflect our own inability to simply believe and embrace the truth of Jesus Christ and what God has done for us and what God continues to do for us in the world? And so that's why time after time in the service here and through our free process and, and, and other ways, we encourage you to look around and see God's presence and activity in the world. Uh, because without looking and being very intentional, sometimes we do fall into doubt and disbelief. But it is a joy, as I said, to be together today. Um, and on your way in, hopefully you picked up a little packet for communion. And uh, there are also gluten-free for anyone who needs that out uh, in the, uh, one of the baskets out there. They're labeled. Of course, at communion time, please just wait until you're instructed to open those. Sometimes it's a little confusing during the prayer. At the table, when you hear those words of institution, it can feel like, well, that's the time to open them. I'll, I'll inform you. I'll instruct you. I'm going to do that. So please do that. You'll find a piece of paper in your bulletin that kind of instructs you about activities. I've seen that they're all very safely distanced. The reason that we can meet inside is because so many in our community um, have had at least one vaccine, if not both. And of course, we're observing that social distancing that's important whether or not you've had a vaccine. You're wearing masks for the same reason. And although we ask you not to be singing out loud the way that we could outside, you are certainly welcome to come along with that with the hymns and the songs, especially if they're familiar to you. And if they're not familiar to you, that's how you learn. And so, again, it is with joy that we gather today. I encourage you to simply remain in your seat. You don't need to do the sitting and standing that we are so accustomed to throughout our liturgy. Uh, but just to sit in your seats throughout the, the, uh, the service, of course. The restrooms are open if you should need to make use of the facilities. That is wonderful. But again, a warm welcome to you all. And we begin our, our worship today. With the thanksgiving for baptism, you'll see that the baptismal font is open and the paschal candle, otherwise called the Christ candle, is lit today as it is throughout the Easter season. I'm being asked to do this. I'm far enough from you. Is that better? Okay. I'm told that that's better. So we begin with that thanksgiving for baptism. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Today we gather, refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ. We thank you, risen Christ, for the waters through which you have made us new. Renew us continually in the gift of baptism through which you have called us, anointed us as your disciples, marked us with your cross, blessed and sealed by the Holy Spirit to do good works. <clears throat> Make us one risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with light. Let us praise and honor you in the glory of God and through your Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first song is Mighty to Save.
receive our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy, we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the readings. The first reading is from Acts, the fourth chapter, 32 through 35. A reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from First John, the first chapter through the second chapter, the second verse. A reading from First John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declared to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie, and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, 
they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for children's message. And so 
so throughout this season, you're going to see that candle lit. The other times in the year when that candle gets lit are for baptisms, because in baptism, we're filled with joy and we remember that the grace and the, and the wonderful gift that we get in baptism is Jesus' promise that Jesus will always be with us and that we will be with Jesus when we die. The baptismal camp, the baptismal font is open for the same reason, so that we can remember, because it's a powerful thing for us to remember. The other time when that's lit is at funerals. And can you think of why we might want that candle lit at funerals? If we light it all the way through Easter, to remember Jesus' resurrection and the promise we get through his resurrection. And if we light it for baptisms, why do we light it again at funerals? Do you think so? Yeah, because people have joy and we need to be re reminded that they have a certain kind of joy that they're in now because when we die, we will go to heaven and we're with Jesus. So when you see the pastor wearing white and when you see that candle lit, you can always remember that promise that Jesus is always with us and we know that that promise is real because Jesus rose from the dead. And today, in the gospel, if you, didn't, if you weren't listening to the gospel story, you might have your parents read it to, uh, to you again later. We begin to hear about how Jesus came and visited his disciples even after he, he, he died and rose again. Okay? So I hope we remember those things. Even though we're sad when somebody dies because we're going to miss them, we can also have a certain amount of joy, and that's what the flowers are about. And that's what the candle is about. And that's what the baptismal font promises us to be lit to. Okay? So we're going to pray in just a minute. And then on your way back to your seats, if you would like very carefully, you can take one of those flowers out of the, out of the wreath there, and you can give it to your seat, okay? Pull it gently out, okay? All right, so let's pray, and we'll have everybody to repeat after the flowers, please. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for the promise that you give us. Thank you for the promise that you give us. Because you rose from the dead. Because you rose from the dead. We will live. We will live. In a special way with you. In a special way with you. Forever. Forever. In the meantime. In the meantime. Bless our hands and our feet. Bless our hands and our feet. To be your disciples. To be your disciples. To do your work in the world. To do your work in the world. And to love to love. Amen. Amen. All right. You can each take it up. Uh, I'll just stay here so that you can pull gently out. It should come right. There you go. Okay. Very good. Whoops. You might want to take another one there. Just in case.
um, it's a very important obligation and a very important duty to be to be um, honest. And so the charge to us all is that we come to the table like Switzerland, completely neutral on all sides, right? In essence, then, our duty at the very beginning of the case is to listen carefully, but until we have been, something has been proven to us beyond that reasonable doubt, we need to doubt the claims made by both sides in their opening arguments until we can see with our own eyes and hear with our own ears and decide with our own minds through a preponderance of the evidence what to believe, what the truth might be in this matter. Today we have a case like that with the disciples, and we have a case like that before us as Jesus. The risen Lord Jesus visits the disciples. As I told the children, it was the night that the women had gone to the, the tomb and had found it empty, and that evening the disciples sit in fear. They're huddled together behind locked doors, not sure what any of this means, still grieving the death of their beloved master. And Jesus then comes and stands before them. Whether he comes through the wall or through that locked door, we don't know, but he's standing before them. And no one has answered a knock on the door. But as he stands in front of them, first words that he utters are peace. Peace be with you. And then he shows them his hands and his side. And as they look upon his crucifixion wounds, they begin to get excited. They know that this has to be Jesus. Not only does it look like Jesus, but the evidence that they have in front of them is that this, this visage of Jesus is the one, Jesus is the one who was crucified, who has bared the marks in his hands and his side and his feet. Here is Jesus, the one that they mourn, standing before them. And then he speaks again and again the same words, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And with that, Jesus breathes. Jesus empowers the disciples by breathing the Spirit into them. And then offering up words to commission them to be his hands and his feet. Doing his ministry, sharing his love, and serving the people. God has given them to serve. <clears throat> of course, we all know that there is this one disciple, Thomas, who is missing. And we can just imagine the scene when he returns. Thomas, you'll never believe it, the disciples say, because of course they're excited. Our Lord was here. He was standing right here, right in this very room, right in this very spot. And not only that, he spoke. He spoke to us. We saw his wounds. It is truly he. And of course, we know the story. This is where Doubting Thomas earns that moniker because he says in effect, sorry guys, you're right. I don't believe you. I can't believe you. It doesn't make any sense. It's too fantastical. You were just all overcome with your exhaustion, with the heat, with whatever, with your fear and your worry. It just can't be possible. But they exist all the more. No, no. We tell you it's true. We swear it. We have seen the Lord. So poor Thomas tells that, them that unless he sees those wounds for himself, unless he can put his finger in the wounds of the hands and, uh, uh, of Jesus' hands and his own hand in, in Jesus' side, he just, he won't, he can't believe. Because you know, Thomas is just a logical kind of God, like a lot of us. What Thomas needs is evidence, cold, hard evidence that proves to him, beyond a reasonable doubt, that what he sees is true and what he's heard is in fact factual. For him, without such evidence, the jury is still out. Without proof, beyond a reasonable doubt, Thomas will not, cannot believe. Poor Thomas. I always have felt that he gets a bit of a bum rap here in the story as it's presented in our gospel today because, of course, we have nicknamed him Doubting Thomas, whom we often judge to be a perfect example of faithlessness. And yet, truth be told, Thomas operates the same way that we all do in life. For most things, we need to see proof. 
how we survive, knowing what's factual, what's true, and what's not. When Jesus first appears before him, the other disciples were confused and fearful too, because they doubt the vision before their very eyes. When we suffer pain and we see unnecessary suffering, or suffering of any kind, doesn't doubt seep into our minds as well? Don't we wonder why? Don't we ask that question? Isn't it simply wise to doubt what we don't know is true, especially when it seems impossible? Well, Thomas often gets singled out as the doubter in the group. It occurs to me that Thomas was not the only one who had difficulty in that day and in the days following the crucifixion. That very morning, Mary lacked understanding in her encounter with the risen Jesus Christ until he spoke to her, until, in fact, he called her by name. And when she reported to the disciples that she had seen the risen Lord Jesus, they couldn't believe her either. They didn't they doubt her? And in this very account, before they could react to this first appearance, the one that Thomas was absent for, before they could speak, Jesus got there ahead of them. He showed his disciples his hands and his side. Before they could react, he showed them the evidence, the proof of his identity. Because Jesus knows, he understands how hard it is for us to believe. How hard it is for us to know that something is true if we cannot see it for ourselves. If we don't witness the ex ex or experience the evidence ourselves then we can't know it for ourselves. He knows that our human minds search for order, to make sense of things, to understand the world around us. And what is encountered in these stories is simply contrary to natural law, to logic, and to any other tool or assessment that we normally use when we make those judgments in our lives. Doubt and wonder indeed are natural responses to what we cannot understand, and it is in our nature then to pick apart those confusing things, to assess what we can find. It's the way we're hardwired. After all, our judgments are important for our survival, aren't they? <laughs> Blesses them with peace. And not just with any peace, 
with the indwelling peace of knowing that our Savior lives. This is the peace that the world, that reason, that logic cannot give. Jesus blesses them and us with life. For the Gospel tells us that here when Jesus visits the disciples in the upper room, he breathes new life into them as he equips them for mission. Back a couple of chapters in the Gospel of John, in the farewell discourses, Jesus promised his followers a life shaped by joy, the kind of joy that I described for the children, the joy that this candle on the baptismal font reminds us of, of these color bright reminds us of. The peace that Jesus offers the disciples comes from the knowledge that in spite of the hurt and the harm that all that the world can and does inflict, God's compassion and care embodied in Jesus stand again in our midst and always will. Because Jesus abiding love is that love that presence that even the cross and even death on the cross cannot destroy. At the heart of the story is that God makes available just what is needed for faith. Jesus doesn't. He doesn't become angry. He invites Thomas to satisfy his need. He doesn't limit the grace and mercy that he offers to those in the room. Instead, he promises to reveal God's presence to those in the future who come to believe and who love him, despite the, the fact that we do not see him. That we cannot place our hands and our fingers in his wounds. This is the way, my friends, that God works. Knowing how fragile our comprehension and faith can be, God provides a way for us to remain and abide in him. For this reason, Jesus came to live, die, and rise again. Jesus came into the world to bring light, to share God's revelatory world, word, and to bring us to everlasting life. No longer will sin and doubt define us. Not only is God present in the world, but God is present here and now. And God is present always and everywhere to meet our need. Through Jesus, God meets us in our doubt and provides the means of grace, the means of living and believing, even in the midst of our unbelief. Through the baptism for which we gave thanks today and through this holy meal that we will share in just a while, that grace comes to, to us to strengthen us, to strengthen our faith, to strengthen us in trust, and to nurture us in the way of believing. You see, God grants us faith itself, the person of the Holy Spirit, the breath of life, the advocate who works in us and with us and through us and for us. And God places us in the midst of community where we are nurtured and supported and can grow into the people that God intends us to be. Throughout the Gospel according to John, we are met with stories. John is a great storyteller. Here at the end of the text for today, John reveals why this is true. There is a grand purpose behind his writings, and it is this, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing that you will have life in his name. John is providing us evidence so that we might believe in Christ. No longer should we live in doubt. Instead, may we live in trust and faith that because Jesus lives, we shall share in the abundant life he came to bring. We don't know if Thomas actually touched 
Jesus' wounds, or whether he put his hands in Jesus' side. It seems doubtful that John would have left out a detail like that, but what we do know is that Thomas utters what is one of the strongest claims of faith found in the New Testament when he says, My Lord and my God. With these words, my friends, Thomas leaves no doubt about his judgment of the evidence. With these words, Thomas invites us to believe with him. He invites us to believe, to have faith, so that we might live always and forevermore in relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen.
you proclaim the blessing of life forevermore, like dew upon the mountains. Refresh your creation, restore waters, cleanse the air, and provide revitalizing moisture to parch the land. Give your whole creation the promise of new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. You direct the nations, O God, guide all in authority, that they shepherd their peoples in the ways of your love. Defeat in us our impulse to war. Bestow the peace of Christ upon those in authority, and breathe upon them the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. You place within the heart of the church a spirit of sharing. Give us the power of your generous spirit that we provide for the needs of others. We ask healing for those in need in body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for Joan, Sharon, Kelly, Joe, the Gerst family, Beverly, Susie, Becky, Jen, Marcos, Mary Ann, Lily, Mel, Tom, Nancy, George, Beverly, Ed, Pat, Christina, Barbara, Carolyn, Don, those who are on our ongoing prayer list, those affected by COVID-19. Are there others for whom we should pray? Announce your peace to those who are lonely, hurting, suffering, or afraid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You give us fellowship with one another in this faith community, Zion Lutheran Church. Shine the light of the risen Christ in our life together so that we live in love for one another and make our joy complete by the sharing of our love with our neighbors, both near and far. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You share the gift of eternal life. In thanksgiving and remembrance, we recall the lives and gifts of those who now live in endless joy, especially Rosa, Barb, Judy, and Bertha. Unite us with them in resurrection hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our yeah. prayer. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you.
this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Through him, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It is now time for you to pick up your, your packets. And there are two pieces of film on them. The first, if you peel it back, will reveal the cracker or the wafer. And the second will reveal the grape juice. If you have one of the gluten-free, then you'll have to flip the cup upside down and you'll find the wafer underneath. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. If you'll reveal the grape juice then, the blood of Christ shed for you. Craig Seaver, who is uh, heading our, um, our property. 
offering our focus these days. Our final song is God Will Make a Way.